Hey, it's Dean. I'm back again. You multi-genre music man. Um, I welcome back, uh, Triple M family. Uh, if you want to be a member of the Triple M family, all you have to do is uh, subscribe and ring the bell. Please do that now. Uh, make it easier. Um, then you'll be known whenever a new video comes out. Um, I got another one of these uh, murder mystery type things. This one is kind of spooky because it says. 115 people became missing at a colony um, and then the rest says a secret was hidden in plain sight the lost colony of Roanoke I'm kind of curious what made 115 people in Roanoke disappear so we're gonna hear it from the horse's mouth Mr. Uh, Ballin who we always listen to and uh, we'll see what he says you but I am far more interested in mysteries that have occurred in the relatively recent past. I think it's easier to relate to the people involved because they probably lived their lives kind of similar to how you're living now. Different, but similar, right? You know, and also like the information, if you're looking at a case that happened 50 years ago or less, it's easier to fact check that information and there's probably more in- Oh, in case you're wondering what my shirt says, it says, let's get Randy Kravitz drunk. And it's his uh, picture from his, uh, mug shot he had done so if you're just wondering what it said on the bottom that's all it says let's get Randy Travis drunk information about that case whereas if you're looking at something that's happened let's say hundreds and hundreds of years ago while certainly there are people involved and in, in being a human being I can relate to them in that sense but the way they lived is a lot different than we live now and so it's very difficult to, to kind of put myself in their perspective because my experience living on the earth is so much different. And of course, information, even if it was diligently transcribed at the time, it's taken hundreds of years to arrive in front of me now. And so the, the opportunity for information to change or to be passed down inaccurately, or to just be a straight up embellishment is much higher. So the accuracy of information in older cases, it's a little bit up for grabs. So I tend to be interested in more recent mysteries, but there is one case, in fact, that is the oldest unsolved mystery in American history that I have been fascinated with ever since I heard about it in grade school. And the reason I'm talking about it now in this video is not only have I found it fascinating, but there has been some recent discoveries, as recent as 2011, that totally changed the theories about what could have happened in this particular case. And the case I'm referencing is the Lost Colony of Rona. The too long didn't read version of the story is when Rono, England sorry. first tried to colonize America, they set up a colony on Roanoke Island, which is right off the coast of North Carolina. And when it wasn't going very well and the, the early colonists, they needed more supplies, they sent their leader back to England to get more supplies. But when he came back, the colony was gone. All 115 people gone without a trace. And all that was left were two strange messages. One was on a tree, and one was on a fence post, right in where the colony used to be. And for centuries, historians and amateur sleuths alike have debated what those messages mean. But a recent discovery in 2011 completely changes people's interpretation of what happened at Rome. Before we get started, <coughs> if you are a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious, delivered in story format, well, you've come to the right channel because that is literally all I'm going to be doing. And I post three to four times a week. So that appeals to the month of this reconnaissance mission. Well, where is a good spot? Three to four times a week. So that appeals to you. If you would... Uh, I highly recommend that you go to his channel, give him a thumbs up, give him a subscribe. He's really good. His name is uh, Hashtag Mr. Ballin or Mr. Ballin. Um, is his uh, channel name Mr. Ballin. Uh, he does great job at doing these stories, and uh, he's highly, highly recommended by me. Please gently assassinate the like button, and then turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of these cool stories. All right, let's dive in. By the late 1500s, England wanted to colonize America. And in the early 1580s, an Englishman by the name of Sir Walter Raleigh was basically given a permit to go colonize America. Basically, it said, okay, it's you know, 1580, and you have until 1591 
to colonize <coughs> somewhere in America. If you can't do it by then, you're going to lose your permit. He starts getting funding together. He starts you know, looking on a map to figure out where's a good spot to land. And by 1584, he's ready to launch his first reconnaissance mission to America. So in 1584, two ships make their way to North America and they land uh, somewhere in the Outer Banks in North Carolina. They land and they actually quickly befriend the local Native Americans that are there. And in fact, they invite the, these English people to come to their village, which was on Roanoke Island, also in North Carolina, not too far from the Outer Banks. And so these early English settlers are brought to this village and they're able to coexist with the Native Americans really beautifully. They're sharing trade secrets, they're learning how to hunt, they're learning how to do all the things that you would need if you were gonna live in this new land. And, and again, they're being embraced by, by the local population, which was huge. So after one month of this reconnaissance mission, that group of early settlers is, is really excited about the possibilities of settling in America. So they make their way back to England and they, they share their findings with Sir Walter Raleigh and preparations are immediately began to launch an actual colonization effort into uh, Roanoke. So one year after this initial reconnaissance mission, Sir Walter Raleigh is ready to launch this full-fledged effort Excuse to colonize uh, America. And so he sends seven ships with 600 men and supplies that were designed to last that group of people for a full year. So everything's going beautifully. They're sailing their way over to America. And when they reach the Outer Banks, their flagship, the, the biggest and best ship they had that was carrying the bulk of their supplies, their food, their fresh water, it ran aground and a lot of their supplies fell into the ocean and were spoiled. And so this is a devastating blow, and they know immediately that, well, <coughs> not everybody on this, this fleet can actually land here. So they sent 500 men back to England and only landed 100 of the original 600 in Roanoke. Now, as soon as this, this second round of settlers, these 100 men, landed in Roanoke, they went and spoke with the local Native Americans. There was already good relationships built from that first reconnaissance mission, and these settlers were given permission by the local natives to build their colony in Roanoke. So they begin constructing their colony, and everything is going off without a hitch. In fact, the Native Americans were incredibly generous. They, they worked closely with the settlers and you know, did their best to support them however they could. Now, the settlers, they still needed more supplies. They didn't have this robust supply that they planned on having because much of it was destroyed in that shipwreck as they initially made their way in. So they had been promised by the 500 returning crew members that they were going to send supplies by the following winter. So they're anticipating this, this shipment of new supplies, and as they get closer to the winter time, the 100 settlers that are there, they're running incredibly low on supplies to the point where they actually basically run out. And so they had to rely on the local Native Americans' generosity just to stay alive. When the shipment that was supposed to be there in the winter did not show up, and in fact had actually been canceled, they didn't know this, it had been canceled by Queen Elizabeth, uh, who basically said that wasn't important, we're going to focus on things that are happening in England. When that doesn't show up, the tensions between these 100 settlers and the local natives the tension was growing because now there's a huge overdependency. That tension grew to the point where the leader of the settlers and the leader of the local Native Americans began to not trust each other. And in fact, the local natives, instead of being violent, decided that they would just abandon Roanoke and go to the mainland and would just kind of give Roanoke Island to the settlers and that that would kind of solve all the problems. But the English settlers took their retreat as a sign that they were actually going to the mainland of North Carolina, these Native Americans, and were going to be forming alliances with other tribes, and then they were going to come back out and wipe out the hundred settlers. We don't know if that's true, because what happens next is the English settlers, in kind of a fit of paranoia, they preemptively cross the, the water, and they make it to the mainland, and they attack the, uh, the Native Americans that had previously been helping them and keeping them alive, and they actually wiped them out. These English settlers come back to Roanoke Island, and now the paranoia is even higher, because now they don't have supplies, 
they don't know how to live there, they've just basically started a war, and it just so happens that an English-bound fleet... Every time Americans come in contact with Indians, it seems to be a problem. It's, it's terrible. ...was passing by the area on their way back to England, and when they stopped at the colony, the settlers were basically in a panic. I mean, at this point, they've just recently, you know, wiped out this Native American tribe. They're, they're freaking out about what, what's going to happen to them. And they were in such a rush to abandon the colony and evacuate that only 97 of them got on the ships and left. They literally left three people there. They said, well, they're not here for the evacuation, so we're out of here. And so sure enough, that fleet took the 97 settlers and they left leaving those three settlers to fend for themselves. As irony would have it, just days after this evacuation, Sir Walter Raleigh, he had sent additional ships with resupplies and, and reinforcements to Roanoke, and they literally arrived like a couple days after this mass evacuation. But when they arrived, the colony was abandoned, and they didn't find those three men that were left there. So Sir Walter Raleigh's reinforcements just left. And then a couple weeks later, uh, another English-bound fleet passed by Roanoke and stopped to, to check in on the colony, and they found it abandoned. And because they had so many people on this, this fleet that was passing by, they decided to leave 15 crew members at the colony, because they felt like this is an English colony, uh, it's not in total disrepair at this point, and perhaps you know, this is going to be useful to the Crown, or, or we can use it in some way. So they leave 15 crew members to basically guard the outpost while they go back to England and figure out what's going to happen next. So it would be months before anybody went back to Roanoke. So those 15 crew members were kind of hung out to dry a little bit. But uh, a man by the name of John White, who had been a part of that initial failed colony in Roanoke, who had evacuated back to England, he was still eager to colonize America. And so he actually convinced Sir Walter Raleigh to launch a new expedition back to America to try to recolonize, not in Roanoke, but slightly north in the Chesapeake Bay, which was just viewed as a more fertile and, and just more advantageous position. And then in 1587, they send out three ships back to America to try this colonization effort all over again. It is important to note that unlike the first effort, which was much more kind of militaristic, it was literally 600 men that got sent to uh, America. This time it was going to be a more kind of civilian approach, where it was men, women, and children being sent over to America to colonize. So with John White as the captain of these three ships, they're, they're making their way towards America. And again, their plan was to go north to the Chesapeake Bay area. Uh, but they intended to pass by Roanoke on purpose because they knew about those 15 crew members that had been left there, you know, almost a year prior. And so they intended to stop at Roanoke and, and basically have a meeting with those crew members, give them supplies if they needed it, and then make their way up to the Chesapeake Bay. However, something strange happens where the chief navigator, a man by the name of Simon Fernandez, who had navigated during the initial... Um, reconnaissance mission, the very first uh, trip to America, also navigated for the, uh, the second trip to America when they, they brought the 600 men, now navigating this third trip with, uh, with John White. He had the charisma of a real leader and was frankly just very well respected. He's an incredible sailor. And even though John White was technically the captain, really it was Fernandez that really had the respect of all of the people on this trip to America. And so for some reason, Fernandez decided that he just didn't want them to go up to Chesapeake Bay. And instead, uh, when they got to Roanoke to have this meeting with the 15 crew members, um, he just basically told everybody to get off. Like, we're not going to go north. Everybody that's here to colonize, go ahead and get off because we're out of here. And John White didn't put up a fight. I think he recognized that the pull this guy had was going to be too much. And the crew and everybody who was there just kind of accepted it. And so even though it was a total deviation, they just begin to colonize Roanoke, even though, again, that was never their plan. So as they're literally descending upon Roanoke, they're, they're getting ready to meet with these 15 crew members who are really hoping are still alive. But 
there's no sign of it. There's no sign of the crew uh, that were left behind, and all they find is like a little pile of bones, and John White speculated that, you know, perhaps this is a sign that the crew members were, you know, attacked by you know, the, the Native Americans that were seeking revenge because they had been wiped out from that, that initial group that had been here, the initial English settlers. John White's suspicions would actually be proven true when just a few days after the, the 100 plus group of colonists that kind of began setting up camp in Roanoke, uh, a man by the name of George Howe was, you know, away from the, the colony a little bit and a, a group of Native Americans surrounded him and shot him with 16 arrows. So it was kind of like a message to the settlers that like, you're not welcome here. You know, your predecessors that wiped out an entire tribe, yeah, we haven't forgotten about that. So you're not allowed to be here. It was not a good start for John White and his, his new colony. Feeling like the colony was kind of doomed from the start, the colonists actually told John White, hey, if this is the way it's starting, we need more people here, we need more supplies. Like, this is not a good start. We are not set up for success here. You need to go back to England and get more supplies and bring them back here because without that, we're doomed. And it just so happened that Fernandez, the guy that had kind of ditched them, he hadn't left uh, the Outer Banks yet. He had anchored at the Outer Banks and he was basically still available to take people back. And so John, John White initially was against the idea because he didn't want to be viewed as someone that was kind of abandoning the colony when he went back to England. And John White's daughter, who was pregnant, was there. She was one of the early colonies. She was there in Mona, and he didn't want to abandon her. Um, but ultimately, he, he says, OK, I'll go. And he goes and gets on Fernandez's ship, and they go back to England. Now, unfortunately, when he got back to England, England was in the middle of a war with Spain. And so the queen had ordered any ship, any English ship was basically not allowed to leave England because they needed to be able to defend themselves against the Spanish Armada. And so he wasn't able to leave England to go back to Roanoke, whether he had supplies or not, for three years. And so three years go by and he finally, with the help of Sir Walter Raleigh, is able to be, to be put on a convoy of ships that is going back to America with the necessary supplies. And so he heads off. So it's 1590, three years since John White has left Roanoke, left his daughter uh, and to go back for supplies. Now he's back and he's got the supplies and they get to the Outer Banks and they get in their small boats to make their little journey up around to the north side of Roanoke so they can actually get on the island and, and go check out what's happening in Roanoke. And when they land on the north side of Roanoke, they start yelling to try to get anybody's attention. There's no answer. As they walk up into the woods, they notice that there are some fresh footprints right on the beach and then in the woods itself. Uh, but again, no one's coming to greet them, which is a bit of a bad omen because if there are fresh tracks, either it's an English settler, in which case they would be eager to come see them, they'd be running out to meet them, or it's a Native American, which could mean they're, you know, they don't trust the English settlers, right? They don't want to show themselves, or they don't want to be seen, which is also kind of ominous. They start moving in to where uh, the Roanoke colony was, and they see a, they see three letters on a tree. It just says C R O on a tree as they're making their way into the colony. And again, they're yelling the whole time, trying to get anybody's attention, and no one's calling out. There's no sign of life anywhere. So they see C R O on the tree. And they keep moving closer, and now they break out the, the colony. And the colony, when they left, had not been heavily fortified. Now it was very heavily fortified with big pikes, you know, basically like wooden pikes lining the outside of this, this, this basically with a fort. And on one of the wooden posts that was kind of fortifying the outside of Roanoke uh, was the word Croatoan. There is not only nobody inside of this heavily fortified colony, this kind of fort, if you will. It looked like no one had been there in years. The, the grass was overgrown. You know, basically anything of value had been looted effectively. There was, the only things that were left were like really heavy objects that would have been difficult to move. But there was also no sign of a struggle. It didn't, it did, there was not like human remains anywhere. There wasn't a, a clear sign of struggle. I mean, obviously it's this well fortified area which leads you to believe that they were at least anticipating some sort of attack. 
But there was no sign of, of a struggle. They're just gone. John White, he would write about this experience when he arrived and just discovered the colonies vanished. 115 people just gone, right? He wasn't actually concerned because the writing that he saw on the tree and on the wooden post to him meant something really specific. Before he left to go back to England to get the supplies, he had spoken with the people that would be staying there and said, look, if you need to abandon Roanoke for any reason, we need to have a system worked out to where if I come back and you're gone, I need to know what happened. And so you need to leave me a clue, you need to write a clue somewhere of where your destination is. If you're going by choice, just write the destination. If you're being forced, write the destination with a cross. And that will, to me, signify that you've left in distress. And so when he sees Croatoan and Crow on the tree, to him that just means, oh, well, you know, they must have relocated to the island of Croatoan, which was 50 miles to the south. He would detail in his notes that before he left Roanoke in 1587 to, to go get those supplies, he said that the settlers had been talking about leaving Roanoke, abandoning Roanoke, and moving 50 miles north to the mainland, not 50 miles south to an island. The concern was the island was isolated and not a good place to have a colony, and so they were talking about leaving it. And so he just kind of casually mentions in his notes, oh, well, you know, they were thinking about leaving to go 50 miles to the mainland, uh, so that, that might be why they're at Croatoan Island. But that doesn't really make any sense because you're just kind of abandoning one problem set for another. Like, you want to leave an island because an island has unique problems. Why would you go to another island? You would go to the mainland. So that was kind of problematic. So John White believes they've just up and relocated to the Croatoan island. And so he quickly takes his men and he goes back to the ship and they begin to turn and set their course to go south the 50 miles to the Croatoan island. But as fate would have it, the anchor line snapped as they're trying to make their way south to the Croatoan island and the weather was getting progressively worse and worse and they start drifting north and north until finally the captain of the crew just said, look, we, we cannot go to the Croatoan island. It's not going to be possible. And so they had to return to England. John White never would return to America. So he, he actually would end up dying with absolutely no idea what happened to the colony. And in fact, no one really knew what happened to the colony. It was just this huge cliffhanger. The assumption is they've gone to the Croatoan island, but no one could prove that they really had. Literally, for centuries, people just speculated as to what could have happened to this colony. I mean, there's the assumption that perhaps they did just go to Croatoan and eventually kind of assimilated with the Native Americans there, and you know they just became a part of the culture there. Uh, there was other theories that they were you know, wiped out at some point by angry Native Americans, but it was all just assumptions until the 1930s when a small stone was found by a man just out walking around, and he turned it into a museum, and they looked at it, and it was written by Eleanor Dare, who was the, uh, the daughter of John White, uh, the, the pregnant daughter that he had that he had abandoned and didn't get to see again. And she detailed what had happened. And half of the colony got wiped out by Native Americans that were angry at them, and then another percentage were taken captive, and then there's a couple survivors that are you know, barely able to survive that don't really expect to live very long. At the time this stone was found, I mean, everybody knew that the last we had heard from the Roanoke colony was that they more than likely had made their way to the Croatoan Island, because that was the, the word written on the post, the CRO on the tree. I mean, that's what made the most sense. And so why would there be this stone by the daughter of John White 50 miles to the north of Roanoke? Wouldn't it make more sense to have been found on either Roanoke itself or at Croatoan? Like, it didn't really add up. And so a lot of people speculated that that stone had to have just been a fake, a hoax. But in 2011, a major discovery is made in the Roanoke case that actually lends a lot of credibility to the stone that Eleanor Dare had apparently written on. John White was a painter by trade, and he had created all these maps of the colony of Virginia, of North Carolina, of Everywhere he went, you know, he basically painted a map. It was customary when you were, at the time, when you were making a map, 
if you had small mistakes on your map, you would actually cut a new piece of, of canvas and you would put the corrections on that piece and then you would slap it over wherever your mistakes were made. And so it wasn't uncommon if you were looking at a map to see little patches kind of all over the map. And so for, for literally centuries, there were these maps that John White had created that had a number of these little patches on, on the map. And in 2011, somebody who was researching said, well, why don't we look under the patches and just confirm that they really were just that, little mistakes that were covered up and, and corrected with a patch. And it turned out that on one of the maps, there was a patch over a section of land 50 miles to the north of Roanoke, around the area where that stone had been found. And underneath the patch was a star. And the star was set to resemble a fort. So basically, there is an English fort built, basically where that stone had been found. But it had been covered over with a patch, as if the fort was a mistake. Right? Like, oh, whoops, shouldn't have been a fort there. And they put a patch over it. But upon closer inspection, the patch that had been put over that X on the map that signified a fort right where that stone had been found, well, on the patch, there was literally hidden ink where someone had drawn a similar X to, to denote a fort, and they put that over the, the obvious fort symbol that they were covering up. One could maybe make the case that they wanted to signify to someone that was maybe looking for uh, invisible ink. They wanted to signify that that was where the fort was, but they didn't want someone who intercepted the map, for example, the Spanish, because they had just been at war with the Spanish. They did not want uh, you know, them to know where a location of a fort was. Researchers began calling that site where there was that patch, uh, Site X. Now, Site X is 50 miles to the north of Roanoke. And if you recall from what John White had put in his description, when he was describing finding the, the writing of the tree in the post when he returned to Roanoke in 1590, he had referenced that the, the colony was planning to move 50 miles north to the mainland because that was a more suitable place to live. But of course, with the writing on the trees, everyone thought, oh, well, they end up going to Croatoan. Well, now as Site X, that is a location that lines up with what they had originally said they were going to do. And you have that stone written by Eleanor Dare at the same location. And so archaeologists descended upon the area that was Site X, and while they haven't confirmed that there's a fort or they haven't found a fort in the area, they have found metal and pottery that is potentially indicative of an English settlement. And in fact, right now, they're still doing all sorts of archaeological digs and research to try to determine if that is where the Roanoke colony went. But even if that is the answer to the mystery that, in fact, you know, it's just this hidden map and this stone that said, yep, they went 50 miles north. It doesn't really answer the question, which is what everybody thinks of when they think of the Roanoke colony, of why was Croatoan written on the fence post? Why was Crow written on the tree? Why were they there? And how is it that with all these eyes and all this interest in this case, dating back to literally the 1500s, how has no one ever found even one of the remains of the 115 colonists that apparently just vanished into thin air. So it's a fascinating case with recent developments, which makes it even more fascinating. And I would love to hear if you have any theories about what could have happened to the colonists, to leave it in the comments so we can discuss it. So that's going to do it. If you want to be in touch with me, you can hit me up on Instagram. My handle is johnballin416. Uh, also, I post quite a bit on TikTok. My handle is mrballin there. And that's going to do it, guys. Until next time, I'll talk to you guys soon. Wow, do uh, do 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 do. Uh, Twilight Zone type stuff there. Uh, 115 people missing. It's kind of strange uh, to have them all just up and go at once like that, and all or all be killed at once like that. You'd think with some would have survived. Um, if you like this video, please hit the like button, share on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Don't forget to hit the bell button, um, and leave a comment below uh, you can leave comments you can leave questions you can leave um, YouTube links if you have a song you want to hear leave the YouTube link below and I'll play it um, if you want to make a donation to the channel you can use PayPal or um, there's a bunch of other ones you can use that's in the link right below my um, video here 
Um, the money goes towards uh, new video equipment, new lights, new stuff like that, new um, monitors, stuff like that to keep the, the uh, channel going. So if you want to do that, every dollar counts. Uh, if you want to make a dollar or two dollar account, uh, donation, that'd be great. Uh, you can also use the heart dollar sign that um, should be on your screen right now. Um, you can use a credit card to do that. Um, anything would be great. Um, this is Dean saying have a wonderful night and I will see you tomorrow. Have a nice day.